This um, is the cover of the first book that I ever bought about yoga. Um, and I bought this book. I bought it in about 2000, 2001. Were you even born then? I've still got it. And it's a really short book. And the reason why I bought it is because it promised to teach me yoga in a weekend. I had done some yoga classes. I had been to... to um, for, a, for a while, I'd done some a few years before. Um, hi. hi. Um, but I bought this one. And it's great because day one, you learn the sun salutation and you learn a few other things and day two you start off you do you go through it all again and then you start on your front and you're doing all these back stretches um and it's a really short book and for me it was everything that was great about learning yoga in a weekend but there's an argument that it's um everything that's bad about the western appropriation of um different cultural practices in this case an ostensibly indian cultural practice so, there's a book by um, David Palmer and Elijah Siegler called Dream Trippers, Global Taoism and the Predicament of Modern Spirituality. And it's about, essentially about a travel company called Dream Trippers who take Americans and Europeans on a tour of all the sacred sites of China. Um, so it's like quite affluent Westerners going on a spiritual pilgrimage around China. Um, and it's about the relationships between like indigenous Taoist monks and Taoist communities and Westerners who rock up thinking they know more about Taoism, Buddhism and China, Chinese spirituality and philosophy than they do. And the bizarre thing is that often they really, really do. And it's about that encounter between East and West and the kind of tensions and so on. But back to yoga. These are all quotations, um, quotes from the book. So Thomas Sordas has suggested that two aspects of religion can travel well cross-culturally, portable practices and transposable messages. And these are, so yoga as a portable practice is yoga that you learn the sun salutation and how to touch your toes and the, the lotus position and all these kind of things. Very, very portable. And there are some transposable messages, messages that can carry across cultures easily about stretching and relaxing, about prana or breath, about posture and the kind of ethical um, and moral values of that, about that. So in the West, yoga becomes extracted from what we might call an original or, or a more organic context and it's transported to the East, to the West and inserted into European lifestyles. Gym going, going for a run, going for a swim, these kind of like portable practices. So Sordas identifies yoga as an archetypal instance of portable practice. Similarly, the Chinese mind-body techniques of meditation, Qigong, martial arts, Tai Chi Chuan, and so on, are also quite portable. These are also, they're easily extractable from one context and carried to another context. Easily, importable, easily exportable and importable. Although the techniques do have elaborate esoteric meanings and cosmologies, one only needs one's own body, grown in any culture, to try the techniques out. And the degree to which one learns about and adheres to their underlying cosmologies and esoteric teachings is entirely a matter of personal choice. So this is the process by which many cultural practices move from one cultural context to another. An aspect of them is selected, they are exported, they are transposed, they are simplified, they are often um, westernized in the sense of being about individual development. So we'll talk about yoga a bit. Um, so yoga is, these quotations, most of this in yellow, comes from a book by Ben Spatz called um, What a Body Can Do. And this is from chapter two, which is on your reading list. The invention of postural yoga, what a body can do, technique as knowledge. So, 
crucial point about yoga, and we could say this about lots of other practices as well, the word is old. The word yoga is very, 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 very old. But what we think of as yoga is a very modern practice, very 20th century practice. So this is a quote from Spatz. Like other contemporary healing and martial arts, postural yoga draws on ancient sources but is an invention of modern times. It's what we might call an invented tradition. Um, and we can see that in my first example, the, the Learn Yoga in a Weekend book. That's an extraction of some practices from a tradition moved into a different context. It becomes something very different, something that I can do on my own in the living room 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. So, I, so much of what is currently practiced under the name yoga dates to the early 20th century. It is not a direct continuation of ancient yogic tradition, but rather a conscious invention of modern times. There's no single ancient tradition of yoga, and those very old texts and documents that do exist have strikingly little in common with most current practice. So, even, so there are ancient yoga texts, and there's also an argument that a lot of these so-called ancient yoga texts, like ancient Tai Chi texts and ancient Kung Fu texts, they may well have been written at the end of the 19th century and discovered by people. But there are some old, old texts, but, and they talk about yoga. But what they're referring to is something either that we don't know what it is, and it's certainly not postural yoga, it's certainly not the sun salutation, and certainly not all the other postures that, that we know about. So that means that even if we now went back to a really ancient text about yoga and went, hmm, well what actually did they mean by these things? And we tried to reconstruct it and find a more authentic yoga. That would still be an invention. That would be an invented tradition. We'd be using old materials to invent a new practice in the here and now. So these two things I want you to, to carry with you into your essays, especially if you start talking about uh, cultural appropriation or East and Western kind of borrowings and so on is that it might not be everything is, a, is, is often a reconstruction a reinvention in modern circumstances so it's here says Spatz Yoga developed in direct rivalry with European organizations like the YMCA. So the YMCA is the Young Men's Christian Association. And in the West, along with associations like the Boy Scouts and so on, these associations were set up to try and produce good, strong, moral Christian men. They did sports, they did exercise, they did prayers, they did Bible stuff, they... They, they did all sorts of things. So there's still there's YMCs everywhere. There's cheap gyms and all the rest of it. All over the place, all over the world. And other countries responded by going, see what the Europeans are doing there. We should do that. We need to sort this out. So, in, so yoga was something that was kind of instituted in India and said, this is, this is an Indian version of this. But let's not mention that it's an Indian version of this. This is a way of strengthening the nation. They also, India did, also did it with wrestling in a big way. China did it with the Jingwu Martial Arts Association in Shanghai, which was set up to directly rival the YMCA and to champion indigenous cultural arts. Ancient arts are taught through these institutions, but they're codified and simplified and modernized. So yoga rapidly expanded through the inclusion of physical technique borrowed from therapeutic gymnastics, calisthenics, calisthenics and bodybuilding. Yoga, as we think of it today, bears more in common with the type of gymnastics that was being developed in Sweden than anything that was happening in India prior to this. Nonetheless, you still have entrepreneurs um, who well, actually, I want to say one more, one more tiny thing about this, about this. The idea of something like yoga, which is an ancient word, and it's an ancient Indian tradition that, that 
is just mushy and vague. People don't know what it is anymore. You invent a new practice and say, this is yoga, this is Indian, this is ours. It's not Western, it's not Chinese, Indian. So you kind of fudge over the modern invention of it, the, 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 the made-upness of it, and say it's ancient. This happens all the time. Like it's St. George's Day today or something, is it? Or this week or something? St. George's? So you get all your English racist nationalist bullshit about St. George. Who's a completely sort of made-up character who certainly never went to England and was is the patron saint of dozens of countries. And then there's counter-memes circulating around the internet. Like my sister-in-law just shared an ultra-racist thing and I'm like, oh my god. That's so racist. My England and proud to be English and it's like, don't, please don't be proud of that. But then there's other memes. St. George never even came to England, you know. He wasn't even English. <laughs> anyway, so this, this, it's the playing of history in the invention of tradition, the appeal to ancient history as a way to legitimate a practice or nationalise it and, and generate a sense of national identity. These practices are often deeply ideological. Yoga is, uh, has been a deeply ideological text, um, practice. Um, and you have key figures such as Krishna Makarya who um, were central in instituting this as an Indian practice. There's a lot of words on here. I'm not going to read them all out. Um, you can read them later because they're all on, on, online. So yoga today. Um, this is um, taken from um, a documentary on Netflix which I can't remember what it's called at the moment. I should have looked at it. It's a documentary about Bikram Yoga, and it came out in about 2020, 2021. And it's about the way in which um, Bikram sold this Indian practice and his special version of it to affluent Westerners. Um, and they became... Uh, like disciples, like apostles, like 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 intensely sort of um, religious subjects. But this is a very different practice to to anything that was happening earlier. It's a transformation of it. Um, so it's branded differently. It's commercialized. It's exoticized. This isn't just um, this isn't just aerobics. This isn't just stretching in that boring way. But that you see like men do sometimes where they're kind of like, oh, yeah, right, I'm ready, ready for football now. It's not that, it's proper stretching, right? Big, proper breathing and um, impressive stretching. I love that male stretch. Right, so we're going to go for a run then. Right then, let's go. <laughs> ah, dear. Anyway, so Bikram's product is a particular synthesis of pedagogical and physical technique that, for reasons worth investigating, has had enormous appeal for a relatively privileged class of urban practitioners. This relates to the health and fitness paradigm. So this yoga is imported or reinvented for a health and fitness culture. Spatz talks about healthism. We live in a healthist environment. All discourse, or media discourse, or newspaper stories, or documentaries, or doctors who pop up on the telly evaluate things in terms of healthism. Are you going to lose weight? Is it going to lower your blood pressure and other indicators of, of you know, concerns about morbidity and so on? Um, is it going to help you live longer? Or are you going to be able to run faster? It's like it's healthism. So I might, I might read this. I might read some more, some more, all of this. How much time have I got? Um, the influence of healthism upon the practices it frames goes beyond language to shape the ways in which technique from all over the world is altered and assimilated in order to fit within the relatively uniform environment of the gym, studio or health club. So, like today, if you do yoga, you go to a class once or maybe twice a week and then you take that home and you practice at home on your yoga mat. Same if you do Tai Chi, same if you do Kung Fu, same if you do all sorts of things, right? Because this is 
in the paradigm of healthism, you get your workout and then you practice yourself. So you're learning some techniques and you're, you're, you're doing it for your workout. But that's not necessarily the way these practices have operated and still operate in other cultural contexts, where they're knitted into the fabric of, of maybe religious belief, cosmology, philosophy, daily life, in completely different ways. It's not just distilled down to that hour, hour and a half in a nice studio. There's an argument, and it's quite a convincing argument, that the way yoga became so successful in the West was to do with kind of middle class women who they didn't want a gym, they didn't want sport because that's competitive, they didn't want stuff where there'd be men looking at them, they, did, they wanted something that was quite nice. So yes, yeah, yoga studios tend to go for the quite nice, nice maybe sprung floor or matted floor, good, it's warm, double glazing, plants maybe, nice, nice. And that yoga kind of eked its way into the, into the Western world through this entry point. Um, it's not sport, it's not competitive, it's not bodybuilding, it's not weightlifting, it's not running. It's something different, something quite nice. Um, in this regard, the transformation of yoga is exactly parallel to the crossover into mainstream fitness of the work of Joseph Pilates, the transformation of hip-hop dance into aerobic exercise in fitness clubs, and many other recent healthist reframings of embodied technique, as embodied disciplines like yoga, kung fu, tai chi chuan, capoeira, hip-hop and tango are all repackaged to become health and fitness modalities, they undergo sometimes radical changes at the level of technique. Certain aspects of the technique that previously structured them are extracted for use, while others are forgotten or ignored. At its most extreme, healthism reduces all forms of embodied technique to different flavours of exercise. This, we could call this cultural translation. Practices from different cultures translated into the West. And if they're physical cultural practices, we're like, well, is it, in what way is it good for me? Will I lose weight? Will I get a six pack? What will I get that's meaningful in this cultural context? Okay, capoeira. Okay, hip hop. But will I get a six pack? That's, will I become more aerobically fit? These, this is translation and transformation of something. Um, different flavours of exercise, all of which are directed towards a single reductive image of health. Then it becomes possible to ask in all sincerity, will yoga make me thin and happy? Perhaps. But that's a very Western and very contemporary kind of set of concerns. While, a, while such a question says little about yoga and virtually nothing about health, it tells us a great deal about today's biopolitical landscape and about the pressures faced by anyone who hopes to learn or teach yoga within it. So, yoga has been athleticized into, into sporting, almost sporting-like terms. It's all about fitness. And it's about healthism. It's all about performance. So I'm not going to read this long quotation out because I've gone on too long. But I think you should read this afterwards. I want to go back to the end to um, where we began with my yoga book and Palmer and Siegler's book Dream Trippers. So these are, this is all a quotation from, from Dream Trippers by Palmer and Siegler. The anthropologist Tusali Srivanas, in her study of the highly globalized Sai Baba movement, analyzed four stages in the process of transnational cultural mobility. One, disembedding, in which specific practices or concepts are extracted from their originating cultural matrix. That's definitely the case of my Learn Yoga in a Weekend book. It was possibly my entire experience of yoga, my entire experience of martial arts, disembedding. Codification and universalization, in which the often unspoken, inexplicit and unsystematized notions, practices and modes of transmission are codified and packaged into explicit statements, discourses, procedures and staged levels of practice that can be easily transferred and made meaningful in any context. 
you could sell my that yoga book could be sold sold oh that's the word from Newcastle sold all over the world including India latching and matching in which the transferred forms are given latching mechanisms that enable them to match up with the interpretive maps of meaning within other cultures yoga means something because it increases your physicality in a way that maps onto western cultural values um, yoga as we do it now looks more like the gymnastic classes of the early 20th century you know when you see kind of documentaries and stuff online about the development of Nazism and the Nazi party and, and then Hitler youth and school stuff and you've got these black and white this black and white footage of like school children waving clubs around and, and doing everything synchronised and doing all this exercise and doing all this stuff. This is, it wasn't just Nazi Germany, it was essentially every nation was doing their version of this. We'll get our school kids, we'll train them to become physically strong and it was all part of cultural appropriation. You know the, those juggling clubs that people use? They're called Indian clubs and you can get heavier and heavier ones. And they still use them now, they're quite fashionable. And there's videos of people doing all these like exercises with these clubs. Um, and that was like a British colonial takeaway from India. So the British were in India and they're like, these kind of Indian guys are pretty hench. Like, how come they're so massive and strong? And they've been doing clubs training. Well, they've been doing clubs for wrestling purposes. And the British Army were like, we'll have a bit of that. Indian clubs. And then it's in British school system. And you've got all these people doing these demonstrations of clubs. I've got them. I swing them about. I think they're fab. Um, why am I telling you that? Can't remember. But, latching and matching. Let's say that that's the direct connection. Finally, contextualization and re-embedding, in which the exported form is incorporated and embedded within the broader ecology of meanings and practices of the host culture. So hopefully you should have an, a, enough tools now to, to not fall into the authenticity or original trap. Original yoga is a myth. Like, it's something we imagine. We imagine mythic Indian yogis from centuries ago. There probably were. There were. But we don't know what they were doing, and we don't know anything about it. And when we use that myth today, we use it for ideological reasons. So, myth... Uh, sorry, origin and authenticity. Careful with these words. Origins are almost always hybrid and multicultural. And authenticity is an extremely, extremely dodgy concept. <laughs>